the struggle for human rights has moved online. And the availability of the internet and new technologies has helped people to access information, to organize, to freely express themselves and to document human rights abuses, which can then be shared with people all over the world. What we've found over the last few years is that surveillance technology is being used by repressive regimes to target those that challenge their authority, targeting pro-democracy supporters, human rights activists and opposition journalists. A lot of companies uh, worldwide supply these technologies to authoritarian regimes like in Bahrain or Syria or Libya. There was a group in Morocco, Mama Finch, who were targeted by an Italian company's software. Um, their software was called Hacking Team. And the, uh, all of those journalists were placed under surveillance. There's one case uh, known very well, uh, which is Alaa Shehabi. Uh, she's a journalist, she's also a university lecturer, and she lives in London now. She comes from Bahrain, um, and she, she has a blog, it's called Bahrain Watch, and she's involved in, uh, in different NGOs and, and human rights movement. And she had been sent uh, suspicious emails, uh, and she then forwarded this to a technical expert who analyzed this. And they found uh, traces of the Finn Fisher product uh, in it. Iran is continuing to build a national or halal internet, which is detached from the World Wide Web. In Vietnam, the government tracks and traces the behavior of citizens online and uses it to find dissidents. In Syria, alongside conventional weapons, the government very sophisticatedly used technological systems to repress. We had uh, reported a case of Abdel Ghani Kanja, who is uh, an, uh, like an activist. He's a teacher normally, and he's an activist in Bahrain. Um, and he had been tortured, and during torture, he was shown his uh, transcripts of uh, text messages and calls. These people aren't criminals. They haven't done anything wrong, uh, other than, in the eyes of the government, challenging their authority, asking for the rights that British foreign policy particularly claims to be promoting. Last year I drafted the first digital freedom strategy for EU foreign policy which had many proposals to enhance people's freedom online and also called on the European Commission to take steps to end digital arms trade. It was adopted by a wide majority in Parliament. In some circumstances uh, surveillance technology has been caught up in existing export controls. So for example, Gamma International, a British company um, who provide a, a product called Finfisher, a Trojan that can spy on your computer and mobile phone, uses controlled cryptography and as a result technically requires a license to be exported. The German government uh always uh, publicly states uh, that the internet is very good for freedom, uh, like uh, the Arab Spring, and they say it's very important, uh, but right now they haven't taken any measures to control the export of this equipment. There are also some additional export control um, considerations in place, so sanctions, for example, against Iran and Syria from the European Union. The Big Brother Incorporated project um, is, is our investigation into the surveillance trade, um, understanding the companies that exist and the products that they sell. For the last two years we've been attending arms fairs and surveillance trade shows, highlighting um, the companies that are attending um, and the products that they, send, uh, that they sell. We worked with Wikileaks early on to release the Spy Files, a collection of um, brochures provided um, by these surveillance companies. There are companies there that talk about intercepting entire countries. Um, there are other companies that talk about the ability to intercept 100,000 phone calls simultaneously. Surveillance, censoring and filtering software can be as effective as weapons. This code, although it is technically only a string of numbers, has an impact far beyond speech. There's a huge range of surveillance technologies um, that exist. One I just mentioned, Gamma International, they sell a Trojan. Uh, when deployed against your computer, it records every single keystroke that you press. It can remotely turn on the webcam on your computer. And when deployed against your mobile phone, it can remotely switch on the microphone. They can access uh, even, access even uh, encrypted files if you open them and see them on your, uh, on your uh, desktop. Uh, and it's, the same goes for uh, encrypted email, for example. Other technologies, um, for example, are IMSI catches. These are, these are fake base stations that are portable and they allow the operator to find out 
which mobile phones are in the local area and then intercept those text messages and, and phone calls that they make. Um, mass monitoring interception um, devices and monitoring centers which have been particularly sold out of Germany. And these are, these are central monitoring centers where huge amounts of information is collected and brought together. On March 12, uh, we published uh, our yearly report on the enemies of the internet uh, where we publicly named five companies uh, which are Trovacor, Gamma International, Hacking Team, uh, it was Bull Amesis, now Naxos, um, and Blue Code from the US uh, because these companies have been caught uh, supplying uh, this kind of technology. Prisons all over the world are filled with dissidents, journalists, bloggers and human rights defenders whose laptops, mobile phones, social media or email accounts have been compromised. And sadly, the technologies with which this intrusion happens too often bear the label made in Europe. Companies that are exporting these technologies are mostly based um, in the UK and Germany. There are 255 surveillance companies that we've identified as part of our research, but there's a more like 20 or 30 that are really going out of their way, attending arms fairs and surveillance trade shows around the world and pressing their technology um, on rights abusing regimes. In Europe we have a slightly more nuanced uh, view of free speech. There can be limitations on speech where it's appropriate um, to prevent incitement of hatred um, and I think that in these circumstances this is an appropriate limitation on that. Um, with arms, you can make similar kind of arguments around metal and at what point does metal become a tube and at what point does a tube become a gun. And for me, these products, when they reach a certain state, when they are, when they are surveillance technology being designed for a specific purpose, it transforms them and they have that transformative value that allows them to be controlled. If you have a specific, uh, specific uh, belief that a person does something he shouldn't do, um, then you can go to a, to a court and you get a court order and uh, then you can do some kind of surveillance. Um, but we are talking about regimes that don't have due process, that don't have like a proper legal system. We're not saying that it shouldn't exist. We're saying that it has potential to be used for oppression. Um, and as a result, before exporting, the company can't be trusted in these circumstances to make a fair decision uh, on that. In the EU, lawful intercept capacity is required in telecom systems. But without the rule of law, where are safeguards for people? Is it fair that governments, security services, police and others with power can open a technical backdoor whenever they want? We should not only think about this from a human rights point of view, but also in light of our own strategic interests. We are in good talks in Germany and we are in good faith that this will happen sometime. Um, at the EU level uh, we have the, the dual use regulation which could be amended accordingly um, and then there is the, the international agreement, the Wassenaar arrangement, uh, where there are uh, talks taking place around this issue um, and where something could be done, though so this would be in a longer perspective really. We're in the very early stages of this campaign. Um, for the last two years we've been collecting evidence on this as an issue that we previously didn't know really anything about. Um, now the evidence has been collected, the policy recommendations and solutions have been proposed. From Privacy International's perspective, we need export controls on surveillance technology. Now this isn't going to happen without a push. This isn't going to happen unless the government realise and feel under pressure that this is something that they need to actually take forward.